All right, thank you, Leonard, for hosting us here today for another one of your amazing neuroscience forums. I'm Jay Olson. I'm a cell side biotech investment research analyst at, at Oppenheimer in New York. And Joel Sandler from Humanity and I are going to co-moderate the next discussion panel on exploring new modalities for rare and orphan neurological diseases. And I want to thank you all for joining us and thank our distinguished panelists for sharing their insights with us here today. So it's a kind of a collection of, of two overlapping concepts that we'll be discussing on our panel today. And in our preparation session, we, we listed out a, a number of uh, innovative new modalities um, for CNS, uh, some of which may or may not be for rare diseases, but uh, there's been a lot of news about many of them over the course of the year, including uh, there was actually a, a recently a deal between Novartis and Voyager for novel uh, capsids to treat rare neurological diseases. And uh, we're going to be looking at the overlap with rare and orphan CNS diseases, which uh, we discussed in our, in our uh, prep session, a lot of different um, really uh, clinical trial executional factors as well as uh, strategic issues to consider like patient selection, which came up in uh, a couple of the earlier panels. And then uh, this will all be against the backdrop of a number of macro factors that are listed here. And uh, just to kind of set up the, the context of this discussion, I wanted to um, briefly mention the, uh, the dollar issue that Harry Tracy uh, alluded to earlier in, in his uh, kickoff presentation. The, the revenue potential for uh, novel modalities in rare CNS diseases is significant. And this is, this is just uh, consensus estimates. These aren't my estimates. They're, they're consensus estimates from, from facts that of uh, just kind of a sample of uh, drugs for rare neurological diseases, including debut for Rett syndrome and Relivrio for ALS, uh, Skyclaris for Friedrich's ataxia, some SMA drugs here. So it's just a sample that we excluded. There's plenty of other drugs, including uh, two drugs now that are approved for Huntington's chorea, but they're approved for other indications. These are drugs that are just specifically for rare neurological diseases, and you can see them approaching $10 billion in consensus estimated annual revenues by the end of the decade. So there's plenty of financial incentive here on the table to invest in novel modalities for rare diseases. And with that, we'll get started. Maybe if, if we could just ask uh, everyone to give themselves uh, a brief introduction. Joel, do you want to start? Yep. Hey, everyone. Uh, Joel Sandler, principal with uh, Lumanity. We work with pre-commercial and commercial stage uh, biotech, biopharma, uh, thinking through various elements of commercial strategy. Um, uh, and, and so we support clients all the, uh, from, from preclinical development through clinical all the way up through and beyond launch and life cycle management. Uh, I myself uh, co-lead our CNS practice, and so I've spent a lot of time uh, thinking about uh, the types of modalities and indications being pursued by the panelists today, uh, including rare and some of the more broader and heterogeneous disorders. So I'm very excited about the discussion, and I'll pass it off to Andre. Great, thank you very much. Hi there. Good morning, everybody. Andrea Maritza, CEO of Yama Therapeutics. Yama Therapeutics, it's a, it's a, it's a, bio, it's a biotech. It's a series A clinical stage. Uh, we're working on small molecules targeting several different disorders, uh, neurodevelopmental disorder and the epilepsy, specifically speaking. Now, for the neuro, neurodevelopmental disorders, we're speaking about autistic spectrum disorders, so RAT, fragile X, and the normal kind of idiopathic autism. For the, for the epilepsy, instead, we're speaking about refractory epilepsy, drug-resistant epilepsy. That's why, actually, I'm attending this panel today. This, that's because these are uh, a niche, or let's say there are more orphan rare disorders. Thank you. Um, Aaron Mystery, CMO with Minarex Therapeutics. We're a small European biotech with a single molecule, but with multiple potential indications. We're in the clinical stage with phase two, phase three studies, um, 
particularly in our lead indication of adrenal leukodystrophy and a pathway both for Europe and for the US in terms of regulatory activity. Greetings, everyone. My name is Dirk Tai. I'm the CEO and the CMO of a company called Quince Therapeutics. Um, we have this really interesting technology. It's, um, we're talking about novel modalities here. In some ways, this is novel. In some ways, it's not. We actually use a machine to process red blood cells to encapsulate molecules. And our lead molecule is a pro-drug of dexamethasone. So it's a way of taking someone's blood encapsulating it with dexamethasone and then administering that back to them, which slowly releases it over the course of a month. And by doing so, avoids the chronic toxicities associated with steroids. And we're developing this first. We could obviously develop for, for a lot of things, but um, we're first going after ataxia telangiectasia, which is a, a rare disease affecting about 10,000 kids in the US and Europe and has no approved therapies, a very devastating disease. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Jesus Martin Garcia. As my name clearly says, I'm Swiss, or at least the CEO of a Swiss-based company, public company called Genuro. Genuro is really focused on the biology of human endogenous retroviruses, because you may or may not know it, but all of us here in this room are part human and part virus. 80% of our DNA is actually made of viral genes, which are the viruses that contaminate our ancestors. And what we're interested in is in pathogenic situations in which some of these genes are producing pathogenic proteins. And they play an important process in, in neurodegeneration in uh, indications such as MS or neuro post-COVID, of which I'm not gonna talk here because they're not really rare diseases. Uh, but for example, also in ALS, where we have a partnership with the NIH, uh, seeing that there's one protein called the envelope protein of the HERF-K family which is uh, found in ALS patients and that has been shown to be uh, killing motor neurons. So we are very uh, interested in this biology dedicated to CNS and dedicated to bringing this kind of very novel treatments to patients. Thank you. Hi, good, good morning. Um, I'm Elise Lombardo. I'm the CEO of uh, Noema Pharma, also a Swiss-based um, company. Slightly different, I think, approach in terms of um, our drug development. We are, we are a CNS portfolio company, actually with multiple programs across both rare and I'd say uncommon, so not quite rare, and more prevalent diseases, and really focusing on small molecules. So we have multiple programs actually in rare diseases right now that are currently in the phase two in the clinic. Hello everyone, my name is Marine Bordelais. Uh, I'm working at uh, Ipsen, where I'm leading business development activities for assets in both neuroscience and rare diseases fields. And uh, Ipsen is a global mid-sized company with a turnover of 3 billion euro and equally distributed in North America, Europe, and the rest of the world. And we are really focusing on three TAs, which are oncology, neuroscience, and rare diseases. And we made um, a strategic choice recently is really to rely on external innovation to, to fill our pipeline. Um, and so especially in, in the field of uh, rare neuroscience. So I'm very happy to be here with you today. So thank you again to our panelists for joining us. Maybe just to kick things off, um, I want to talk about some of the advantages of novel modalities over traditional ones for treating rare diseases. Why do we need novel modalities? And how do you go about selecting the optimal modality for the specific disease that you're targeting? Anyone want to get us kicked uh, off? Andre? I'm the first one here on this panel, so I guess. Okay. Uh, now, if you think about orphan and rare disorders, and especially speaking about the neurological disorders, it's it's very challenging environment. That's because you don't develop kind of small, large molecules. Well, actually, we know pretty well as a far, uh, as a pharmaceutical sector, we know we have that kind of knowledge. We we did before, but unfortunately, there are several different challenges. So, from a risk and gain perception we start moving out from the 
uh, low risk, high gain to the high risk and high gain. That's because we start developing new technologies, new modalities in the last few years. And not very long time ago, I guess very five, 10 years ago, if you think about the RNAi. But anyway, the point is that actually we start testing these new modalities where actually we couldn't achieve much of the results that we were expecting of. So we tried small molecules, we tried large molecules, but couldn't get very much, specifically speaking on the alpha and rare disorders. So, so we start moving on on the new technologies. We start seeing some results, uh, antisense oligonucleotides, RNI, and I also support other disorders as well. That's actually where we are going as a, as a new target. So if we think about a kind of a tri horse, maybe if I can say that, it's something that we are approaching this new unresolvable un, un problem with the new technologies. So we are developing something that I've never done before, but that's absolutely a high gain that we're going to achieve sooner or later. Sure. Okay, I'll add something. Um, yeah, just in thinking about you know our typical approach to treating disease, not just in rare disease, but in all types of diseases, we have a tendency to associate a specific protein target with the disease of interest, which may not be directly causal for the phenotype of that particular disease. And then we target something to interact with that molecule, either as an antagonist or an agonist. And, um, over recent years, and this will continue to get better and better, we understand more and more about each specific disease. And in rare diseases, a lot of times, for example, the disease I'm working on, you understand the genetic cause of the disease. And so really what you want is a drug that works, right? And in order for something to work, you first have to understand what's wrong. And a lot of times in drug, drug development over many decades, we haven't known that. We've just, in fact, a lot of things you just find serendipitously, you know, that seem to work. But now that you know more about a specific disease, you need no, new modalities so that you can get really, really precise about interacting with the specific cause of the disease without trying to screw up everything else in the body. And for example, if you have a mutation like this disease I'm working on, ataxia telangiectasia, it's a disease in a gene called the ATM gene. Well, if you map out the biological cascades associated with ATM functions, it's incredibly complicated and affects every single cell in the body. So you can't just start tweaking ATM function and expect to cure the disease and not screw up a lot of other things with the human body. So I think that's, you know, I think we're gonna talk a little bit about AI later too, but, um, all these new tools at our disposal to get uh, more targeted and more precise and get at the heart of what's actually wrong with somebody um, is the key to creating good drugs. Yes, may, maybe to add on that, I think we, we, we have to consider that uh, small molecules are limiting in terms of MOA and are, you know, uh, mostly addressing inhibition, for example, and um, that a lot of targets in neurology cannot be addressed at the protein level. And that, that's why new modalities are really um, needed and necessary to address a rare neurological disease. And that's why I think we see the emergence of um, new modalities at uh, the RNA level, for example. Uh, and it's interesting that there is really key development in with small molecule, but modifying the RNA. And I, I think we will talk about that later, but it's to me one of the key areas where uh, the field have made great uh, progress. And also obviously, as we are talking about neuroscience, we, we have to take into consideration that large molecules are uh, at limited capacity to cross the blood-brain virus. And that's why also we need the uh, new modalities, in specifically in that field. Yeah, and, and, and perhaps to, you know, expand on that a little bit, because a new modality doesn't necessarily mean an advanced therapeutic, something that's uh, oligo-based or cell-based. It could be a, a small molecule or a large molecule, but one that's targeting a, a novel pathway or a novel target. 
but you know, I think to, I think it was uh, Derek who said the importance of being very uh, specific for that target, particularly in rare diseases where we know something about the biology, the, uh, the underlying genetics, uh, and therefore there's an opportunity uh, to, to specifically and robustly target something uh, that's linked, hopefully causally, to the disorder. Uh, and, and, and that gets back to the, the commercial case. Um, these are rare diseases. Companies do need to be able to generate revenue and be profitable. And so when you're going after smaller uh, diseases or subsets of larger diseases, uh, I think there's an expectation uh, that, that you're going to uh, need to really achieve robust, clinically meaningful benefit uh, in order to build a credible uh, commercial case. But um, so, so let, let's keep going. So, so there are a couple questions here I'm gonna combine uh, about lessons learned from prior development expertise in rare neurological diseases and any learnings that can be applied uh, to the new drug modalities from studies in other disease areas. So maybe I'll ask someone who hasn't spoken up yet to, to weigh in on one or both or the combination of those questions. Oh, okay. So I think it's a really important point for any drug development pathway, but in terms of natural history and understanding that first of all, and then also endpoints. So two big topics, and I'll, I'll just cover natural history. And I think with the new modalities, there's a potential because the modalities take some time to get through the de early development phase. There's opportunities to have some of the natural history work on going in parallel. But of course, that takes time. There's resources and funding required for it. Um, so I think that's, but it's significant because the regulators want it. Also, it helps us understand the disease much better in terms of the, the clinical outcomes, which are going to be very important to assess and pick up as endpoints be they primary or secondary. So I think that's one of the key key learnings of addressing that as early as possible. Yeah. And I'll, I'll add that dr drug development in rare diseases is, is really quite different and distinct than in more prevalent diseases. And we engage with the community as, as partners. And I think that's a real key to any successful program. Whereas for more prevalent diseases, we can sort of sit back a little bit and, and engage with one or two choice experts in the field. When it comes to rare diseases, both in terms of understanding what the medical need is that we're solving for and, and how we're going to ultimately deliver an impactful treatment, it really requires very robust, very early engagement and a mindset that we're true partners in the field. If I can add on, on and follow up with with comment from Joel before, and we, since we are speaking about something small, a niche in the market, needs to have a commercial value anyway. So we are moving out from the comfort zone of having a, 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 a symptomatic therapeutic or something actually is going to target directly some symptoms, but we are going directly into the disease modifying therapies. That's actually what the, the, the patients and the, firm, uh, the families and caregivers are expecting from us right now in 2024, because many of these disorders and diseases, we're speaking about rare or from CNS disorders, are lethal. So that's actually where we are going to apply new modalities and new technology specifically, is to change completely and to give an opportunity to these patients to live their life to the fullest, instead of just trying to uh, ponder in a way, trying to make uh, their life easier or better just for a few, for a short time. Maybe if I may, just a, a, a very small point also on lesson learned is that for renewal, the emergence of biomarkers also is very important because from other disease area, we can see that when you add the biomarker in the in the clinical development, it can double your uh, probability of success uh, from phase one to to approval. So, the recent emergence of neurofilament light chain, for example, in ALS or GFAP biomarkers, are really also important and could be really very useful in in the field of uh, renewal. 
Yeah, one other, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah no, but just picking up on biomarkers, I, I completely agree with you of the importance of biomarkers, at least at, at different levels. The first one is in recruiting the patients because biomarkers can really help you identify what treatments could be or not relevant to a patient. For example, what we do in ALS is really based on finding the protein which we believe is causing the death of motor neurons and therefore its presence justifies the admission, the administration of an antibody. That's number one. Number two, in terms of results, as you were saying very rightly, uh, GFAP for sclerosis, NFL for neural stress, incredibly important uh, biomarkers in our field. But at the third level is what the authorities do with those biomarkers. Uh, because uh, although we're all very convinced that strong results on GFAP and NFL really are a benefit for the patient, uh, most of the time the authorities want to see a clinical endpoint. And in neurodegeneration, it can be extremely complex, long, and, and expensive to get to the points where, you know, if, if something is not immediately lethal, uh, like ALS and others, but if we're talking about long-term neurodegeneration, then it is, it is also an, an area which, in which we all, as an, as an industry, as a community, should make an effort to try to sell those biomarkers to the authorities as also valid endpoints for development. Yeah, and along those same lines, because it takes so long and it's so complicated, one important business lesson learned to keep in mind is that, you know, in this field, a lot of the companies are, are small emerging companies. You get one shot at it. You get one study. If your study fails, you're done. So you have to be very, very careful about the disease target you choose, and you have to be very cognizant of the competitive landscape, not just when you're looking at the disease, but what it's going to be like five years later, because it'll change, and patient selection and study design can get really, really complicated. So it's very beneficial to choose the one that, even if it's not the best commercial opportunity, gives you the highest probability of success for that first trial. Excellent. And one of the uh, topics that, that we discussed in our, in our prep discussion was the challenge of crossing the blood-brain barrier and getting drugs into the, directly into the targeted area of the brain. And, uh, you know, I, I had the opportunity to, to speak to Al Sandrock, and uh, I asked him, you know, what was it about Voyager that was so compelling to you? And he said it was the capsid and the fact that you can deliver a gene therapy systemically and you don't have to do a transcranial injection. And, um, you know, another observation that we had chatted about in our prep work was the brain shuttle gantaniramab data that Roche presented at CTAD and, and how uh, interesting that was. So I guess maybe next for the next point of discussion, I'll ask our panelists if they could talk about which modalities they're excited about and which modalities will best help them overcome the challenges of getting, getting their therapeutics into the targeted area of the brain. Andre? Okay, I'll jump in. Um, Two different one. One is pretty biased, so it's a small molecules. Uh, you just heard the news this morning about the new collaboration of uh, Eli Lilly and another company with an artificial intelligence company just to make the right design. And that's because that's where we are heading now. Small molecules, better design, more efficient, and possibly maybe with a better penetration through the BBB. And that's actually why I'm really happy right now. And that's actually where I see the future about the, the drug development and small molecules, specifically in the CNS area. Another one, just to pull up what actually you were saying about Voyager, definitely AAV uh, technology. I think very, it's very promising right now. There are several different universities here based in the US are have screening libraries where actually you can pick up several different kind of AAV and there are tissue specific, so the, 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 uh, it's, it's absolutely a new amazing technology, and you see the star, uh, the new and the new FDA approved drugs are uh, getting more and more and more frequent, in the, and uh, especially right now in the 2023, with several different uh, orphan rare disorders, not in the CNS, but anyway, very promising that I'm expecting very soon to have some news on this for the CNS as well. 
if I may, you know, just take a little bit of the counterpart of that. I don't think there's, there's one numerality fits all. I really, really depends on the biology you're talking about. And we saw this morning a list of all the drugs under development and the exciting things that were coming. And let me remind you that about half of them were antibodies. And that's what we do too. We do antibodies. And yes, definitely with antibodies, you have a slow diffusion into the CNS from the, uh, from the blood. You achieve 0.2 to 0.4. But if your antibody is safe and the target is in the, in the brain, the list we saw this morning shows that antibodies still have a long way to go. Now, there are some transferring receptors and other things that are, that are happening, but it really depends on your biology because you don't want to be completely, uh, you know, uh, have everything on one go and then nothing uh, if you are looking at a long-term biology. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, put away antibodies at this point in time looking at the list of things that are coming up. If the target is in the brain, if the antibody is safe enough, to give high doses, which is the case of most of the things we saw this morning, and certainly ours, then antibodies will have a beautiful future, even in neuro. You know, certainly the ability to give uh, systemic administration and have that therapeutic arrive um, in appropriate potency in the brain is it can be a game changer across any modality. Obviously, I, I'm going to also be biased from my perspective right now, which is small molecule. Um, and, and thinking about innovations that we can take with small molecule to make sure that, that we can be more targeted in our effect, because obviously most of the time we have the easiest time, I'd say, in terms of our, our overall structure of passing, uh, passing through the blood-brain barrier. But we do have to recognize, certainly, while the optimal goal of being able to give something systemic and have it find its way, um, will be a game changer for certain rare CNS diseases, it really is the point that there are multiple CNS diseases that are so quite devastating that local administration is still a viable option. And there are some very important technologies as they're being developed that I, I do see when it comes to um, not external, maybe, maybe external um, um, colleagues where there is, people do shy away from the procedures that are required to make these treatments a, a reality. And I think it's something that we shouldn't shy away from because these diseases are so important, these patients are so motivated, the consequences are so dire to have no treatments there. And we need to make sure that we can be bold and innovative as our modalities and technologies allow. <coughs> Maybe I will add just one point from my business development, uh, let's say, position, is that when we are assessing a, an opportunity, um, the biodistribution of uh, the molecule is very important for us. And that's why we are always looking at phase 1B results, because it's important to see target engagement, uh, PKPD result in the patient, and it also enables the partners uh, to the risk and to and more importantly, you know, to ensure and maximize the success of the of the clinical trial. So it's a little bit linked to the question, but uh, and not di directly uh, uh, spot on. But I think it's important because we are all partners, and it's um, it's really a, a key point in the in the assessment also. Yeah, yeah, and and, and that's a perfect transition because given that this is a an investor conference. Partnering is such a big part of this for small companies in terms of access to non-dilutive funding, uh, not to mention the validation that you get uh, from having be, being able to say that you're partnered with a large company and, and, and all the other uh, ancillary benefits that one gets from partnerships. So, so let's let's build on that both from the innovator side, from the from the partnering, from the uh, licensor side. Um, what, what are some key features for evaluating or positioning a program uh, for value inflection in a way that's going to get uh, a, a perspective strategic uh, incited? Maureen, you can start. Yeah, maybe I, okay, I will start. So um, I, I just want to reiterate what Elise said earlier is that we really are partner in that field, which is a very difficult field. So. Uh, at Ipsen, when we are looking at an opportunity, we, the first thing that we are looking at and considering, obviously, is the 
robustness and the quality of the science. And we really defer to the partner on this because we really think that this is their baby. And when we design the collaboration or a deal, uh, we want it to be collaborative. So uh, that's why we try to bring our expertise, expertise maybe in, in uh, for example, CMC aspects, which are really also important in the, in the neural rare field or clinical activities. Um, so, so that's a first element which is really important, the, let's say the collaborative nature of, uh, of the partnership. Um, and then obviously what we are looking at uh, is we like to have in a way some validation of the target because we discussed that earlier. Uh, okay, these are new modalities, but uh, it doesn't mean that the targets are not validated, either preclinically or clinically. And it's also important because it can guarantee a higher success rate also for the patient. And when you look at the recent approvals uh, in the neuroscience field, we had more approval in the rare neuroscience than in the neuroscience field in general. And it's mostly linked also to the fact that the targets were very well known, uh, well validated. It's the case for CalSODI, we've sold one for ALS. Um, and so it's, it's really important also as a, as a partner to consider that when we are looking at uh, an opportunity. So, so I, I was going to add and, and actually build on some of the answers to the first questions. And it really is what is our responsibility as sort of the, the innovator and, and uh, originator companies as we start to think about rare diseases and a path to delivering a treatment. And, and if we always think about that end game in mind, we certainly have to think about what it is that we can do and then what we need to deliver and, and maybe transition if, if we do need some help on that. But, but certainly there, there are two things that I think are, are very important for us to focus on and to at least sketch out the path for. And you had mentioned CMC, and I think that's so important. And it's an eye towards scalability, to make sure that even if it's a small rare disease, even if we have localized um, delivery or concentrated patient populations, that we have a view towards the scalability of our process and our manufacturing. And, and I think that's so important. We might not be able to do everything because some of those activities are very expensive, but if we don't understand that, I think it's going to be very difficult for others to come in and, and do that work for us. And then similarly, as we're thinking about the feasibility and we're thinking about the promise to ultimately be able to deliver this to patients, it also is about that regulatory path and thinking of those endpoints, thinking about the natural history study that may or may not have to have to happen so that, again, if, it, if we don't have all the answers, that, that might be okay. I'd, I'd leave it to the partners to, to say how far along the road, but, but we have to do that intellectual work to really understand it because we are the experts, both, both in terms of our modalities or our treatment, and oftentimes in terms of these rare diseases, because we're the ones who have really invested the time and understanding with the community and understanding of those, of those outcomes. So um, I do think that's some, some work that we, we really should do as we engage with, with potential partners. Yeah, with respect to the timing of doing a partnership, it comes down to an economic question, I think, whether you're private or public. You're working on a rare disease, the nature of that rare disease will dictate whether you can commercialize it ultimately or not. If it's 5,000 patients in the US, maybe you can do it. If it's 180,000 patients, you probably can't do it. So the first question is, do you need a partner? And then if the answer is yes, then it becomes when. And you need to match the timing of your funding needs with the major milestones that you'll have to build value within your company. So, you know, ultimately you wanna you wanna achieve you wanna achieve some major milestones without having any dilutive financing events in the interim. And partnering plays in with respect to the other macroeconomic considerations related to whether you can raise money and at what terms. So along the way it usually it usually kind of the way it plays out, it becomes fairly obvious when you need to start thinking about partnering, and it's driven by the need for the timing of that money. 
maybe just to follow on to, to Joel's question about partnering, I guess acquisition might be the, the ultimate extension of partnering and, and Biogen acquired Riata for Sky Claris last year. Um, are there certain capabilities that um, an acquirer may bring that um, in the hands of a, of a larger company uh, would unlock opportunities for novel modalities in, in rare diseases that a smaller company may not have the resources for? I think one of the points has been touched upon just before in terms of the sort of getting close to commercialization. Well, some of that work has to start much earlier in terms of reimbursement, health insurances, market access, and that needs a lot of manpower resourcing, which smaller companies have some knowledge of, but they can't deliver it. So I think that's one of the, the key areas that need to be sort of managed. But I think you know that all also comes with the responsibility that Lisa is talking about of small companies are started to deliver a product for the patients, the, the close contact that the small companies have got with the patient organizations, the patient community. We, we have that responsibility of delivering that, and if we can you know, make that much more efficient and ready, that's very important. Mm -hmm. I saw a lot of opportunities in the last few years, and even in the, uh, in the news this morning about licensing, and back to their quarter actually you were saying about um, commercial value of your asset for a potential m a opportunity and especially for uh, a, a new fundraising anyway the point that actually i'm seeing right now a uh, huge number of companies with the new technologies with new skill set actually start doing more licensing activity toward larger companies like an example uh, shape therapeutics with roche specifically on the rna and, uh, especially the soft RNAs. So we're speaking about a large pharma getting acquainted with the new technologies, not developing a new uh, operating unit within the company itself, but outsourcing this kind of uh, skill set and acquiring this kind of knowledge and maybe renewing after a few years after, uh, even as Roche have done with a uh, with shape. And then after that, start seeing where actually there might be a potential inflection point for potential m and after phase two, phase three. That's actually what I'm seeing right now. More kind of outsourcing and de-risking of the pipeline itself. Yeah, and to add on that also, what can large company uh, bring is, is their track record and expertise. If we, if we take, for example, in the, in the case of the biomarker development and the neurofilament light chain, there was a deal recently between Biogen and a, a company called Neurosense in the field of ALS. And it's interesting because what Biogen is proposing is really their ability to measure neurofilament li light chain decrease uh, during phase uh, two uh, for the, the trial led by Neurosense. And then they attach to that a right of first refusal uh, on this program. So it it's also, you know, brings a new perspective in terms of deal structure, and it's an example of how you can really foster uh, the, the expertise of a larger pharma at the service uh, always of the patient, obviously, but uh, of the development of uh, led by, by smaller companies. And then as we think about um, many of these approaches that small companies are taking, and, and obviously so, some on the panel will, will um, have this similar approach and, and others might not, we're often looking at either pipeline in a product or platform in a program approaches. And we're choosing for a number of reasons to go and focus on sometimes a single or maybe two rare diseases, but there are all often broader applications of what we're developing. And I think that that's a very important um, view, perspective, and then, you know, kind of capital structure and, and um, resource structure that larger companies can bring. And it's something that I think can certainly be beneficial, especially early on, as we're even looking at how to develop our programs and technologies. And those sorts of discussions can really help us see where the breadth uh, can come in. And even though we certainly 
um, very thoughtfully choose our first or first and second programs. Um, they're really often uh, broader applications that, that a partnership uh, can, can actually um, really help us advance and point towards. <clears throat> okay, so, so we've touched uh, upon um, the authorities, uh, I think, I think as you mentioned this, and, and the different regulatory concessions that are becoming increasingly prominent, uh, at least in the U.S. from FDA, uh, in terms of getting products for rare disease, rare CNS disorders into the market sooner than later. That, that obviously can be a double-edged sword. Uh, when, when programs get approved with marginal data and, and then that has blowback um, and, and perhaps lowers the bar and has implications for perhaps more innovative programs coming down the line. But uh, I think net-net, you do see uh, a positive from uh, regulatory concessions, including um, accelerated approvals based on biomarkers, single... Uh, uh, submissions, uh, successful submissions based on uh, single arm or, or just single studies uh, that may be supported by, by biomarkers or natural history studies in the case where uh, it's difficult to get, uh, you know, large placebo controlled randomized studies uh, in these rare, rare disorders. So I'm wondering uh, from the panel, uh, if you can speak to just kind of the overall implications of these regulatory concessions, and maybe specifically uh, from your own experience uh, in speaking to regula regulators, uh, what, what you're learning and, and, and how that's, um, uh, w what impact that's, that's having on your uh, development strategy. I think we touched on this point earlier in terms of biomarkers, biomarkers for selecting the patient, biomarkers for following the trial, and biomarkers for registration. Biomarkers for registration, it really depends very much on, on what is the natural history of the disease. Uh, you know, if, if the disease is a, is a, a relatively short natural history uh, where the outcome is, is death, uh, you are not going to get very successful at trying to put biomarkers in between. Uh, but in areas, especially in, in neuro, when you have long-term neurodegeneration, we really have new biomarkers. You mentioned before GFAP and FLs uh, and others that are coming up, which, which can be important. There's still some reluctance. Uh, when you see what has been done, it's been done only, the approvals that have been given are for very, very small patient populations. You could not today imagine, although for example, going out of rare diseases, but in multiple sclerosis, there's a tremendous medical need for stopping neurodegeneration in parallel to inflammation, because 85% of patients will end up in a wheelchair by the time they're 55 to 65. And, uh, but in those kind of uh, indications, there is an absolutely no, no from using biomarkers because the, the patient population is too large. So I think it's a combination of natural history and also of the size of the population uh, that today is the determining factor with the authorities. Let's hope that it, it evolves over time. Yeah, it's such a complicated topic because um, ultimately the three interest groups, the company, the regulators, and the patients want the same thing. They want to know that the intervention works. And, but they may differ in terms of the magnitude of certainty they're willing to accept to know that the therapy works. And, um, you know, biomarkers are complicated because even, even with accepted validated clinical outcome scores, like in CNS, a lot of times you'll use these scoring systems that are based on neurological tests that are performed. And then, you know, you measure these over time. They're, they're not precise and they're not accurate. And that, that's one area I think um, as we move forward where uh, the development of, of new endpoints using AI with a combination of biomarkers or you know, wearable devices or whatever that can create more precise and more accurate, accurate measurements of how a patient feels, functions, and survives over time. Those will really help because based on the tools we use now, the problem is the regulators uh, change the acceptance of such things at a pretty slow rate. So you got to wait for the rules to catch up with what's being developed. And if you're using the older tools, um, there often is 
a question at the end, you know, you'll have a p-value of 0.06, but you had a difference in score that pay clinicians think is reasonable, and there's nothing approved for these, you know, people with this terrible disease. So there's a lot of pressure from the advocacy groups. So it's it's a difficult question to really know if it works, you know. But I think that it'll get better with the development of better assessment tools for knowing whether it really works. All right, I know that we're the last panel standing between our audience and lunch, so um, maybe I'll ask uh, each of our panelists to give us uh, their predictions, look, look into their crystal balls, and tell us what, what's ahead over, over the next year in terms of drug development and rare neurological diseases, uh, where, what areas of progress you expect to see, which modalities you think to play the most important role, and also any macro factors that you think are going to be important over the course of the year, including things like the IRA impact. Andre, would you like to get us started? Okay, I'll start off the first guest with a crystal ball in my hand. Um, yeah, definitely. I would say, as I mentioned before, AI, small molecule drug discovery, that's the three keywords, anyway, the three topics that we are going to see in the, in the future with a great development. And I would like to say more uh, for um, non-orphan, non-rare CNS disorders. But for, for the topic, actually, for this panel, instead, I'm going to see much more for gene therapy. That's actually, I'm trying to summarize what I was saying before. Anyway, it's a gene uh, disease, ther disease modifying therapy. It's, uh, we are going to see much more improvement in the technology itself. And instead of having an uh, intrathecal injection, in example, we're going to seek, we are seeking a new technologies to have a, a, a systemic uh, injection, something actually might be much more manageable. And definitely we might see some more advancement in the caps and the design of the caps and for different kind of tropes for the AAV. And more on that, I would say that we're going to have a lot of fun on the RNA. Meaning we are moving out from the mRNA, uh, the new vaccine, but we're going more on the tRNAs and the transfer RNAs a new engineer tRNAs that were going to, they are going to uh, directly and surgically uh, improve and especially uh, change single nucleotides. And so we're speaking about different kinds of orphan rare disorders where actually there's a single nucleotide uh, modification. So I, I hope that we're going to see that. So yeah, just a couple of points in my mind as to what's sort of coming forward. I think, as you hear from the panel, um, we, we've talked about small molecules, large molecules, new modalities. I think everything should still be explored. So, you know, don't focus on just new modalities as opportunities. The, the unmet need is there. So I think if something is working or giving a good signal, I think that's going to be very important for the patients um, and the community. And then I think the other thing that's really sort of been sort of happening, which I've been watching and listening to, is about the biomarkers. There's a bit of a drift between the FDA and the EMA in terms of how they're looking at biomarkers, the neurofilament light pieces, you know, in the crosshairs of uh, the EMA. Just wondering where that goes. I'm not quite sure. It's something to watch. I don't, don't know what my crystal ball is saying, though. It's a bit hazy. Mm. Yeah, I guess, I guess for 2024, um, my biggest concerns revolve around um, geopolitical and macroeconomic considerations that can, can affect the biotechnology sector. And it's already been fairly devastating over the past year or 18 months. There's been a tremendous amount of consolidation and the fundraising environment has changed dramatically. And I think if interest rates come down and the Fed can achieve a soft landing, of which I'm doubtful, um, that could change things. But if they can't and we have geopolitical problems that escalate and we have macroeconomic strains that lead to 
you know, a recession or, you know, maybe even a severe recession, that could change stuff dramatically. And right now we've got like 250 companies, public companies trading under cash. And I could easily see that situation getting a lot worse. And that'll, when we were, when I was talking before about trying to achieve your value um, defining endpoints before you need money, if the fundraising environment gets worse, that could, that could really affect the overall sector in ways that I can't, I don't have a crystal ball because it's, it's hard to anticipate, but I, I do worry about it. I, I share a word there, Dirk. I think that that's, that's short term. It is the, one of the most uh, terrifying uh, scenarios of, you know, are we going to get out of the sort of nuclear winter that, that we're living over the last two years? But uh, I'd like to also give a Part of optimism, I really, if I had to bet, I'd buy it in biology. I think that we're doing tremendous progress in understanding the biology. There's so much that still needs to be done. We always think about new modalities, new this and that, but at the end of the day, it's the biology of the disease, that is natural history. And there is so much opportunities out there. For example, we just started a partnership with Verily Google Health, trying to look at human industrial retroviruses in some special populations like the COVID populations. Because frankly, we're only looking, what we're talking about, we've sequenced a patient, we actually sequenced 3% of their DNA, and the rest we left aside. So there's so much to understand, there's so much that, you know, if I, our progress in biology is what will drive the progress in treatment. So building on that, certainly we are in, in a tough environment right now, both um, sort of micro and macro as, as we think about that. But overall, um, especially hearing my co-panelists and, and being here at, at the conference, there is tremendous hope that I see in terms of the innovation that's happening um, in CNS, the interest that's back in CNS, thank, thank goodness, and the innovation that's happening, particularly in the rare disease space. I think that when it comes to working in rare diseases, we also have a sort of rarefied opportunity, but it's where real innovation can take place. And, and so um, as we're seeing the exciting and innovative things that companies are doing when they're able to target smaller populations with better known biology and, and you know, perhaps slightly more manageable development programs, it really frees us up to do, do the courageous things in terms of innovation. And so I am hoping that IRA, for example, won't really impact m most of us on, on the panel and that we'll be able to continue to do this kind of work with the support um, of uh, you know, kind of the external community as we go forward. And so I'm hopeful, again, that this uh, can be an innovative incubator in the CNS rare disease space. Yeah, and I will definitely relay this optimistic message because it's true that uh, last year was not a very dynamic environment in terms of deal making. But if you are looking at CNS, it really stands out in terms of uh, volume uh, of deals and also the value of the deals that were made. Mm -hmm. So we have to uh, to take that also into account. This uh, dynamics uh, in the CNS field. Um, and also, um, I think we need to be very optimistic in improvement, as mentioned by all my panelists, uh, co-panelists, in terms of rating scales, because that's true that currently they are limited, uh, patient stratification, biomarkers. Uh, and it's important because if we are looking at, uh, as from the investor side, business development side, if we are looking at the, the volume of opportunities in the rare neuroscience space, it's very limited <coughs> compared to the whole CNS opportunities. So this improvement in terms, you know, of uh, from the, you know, the, the, the genetics, the, the basics of the science, and also all the tools for uh, clinical development improvement, uh, we are hoping that it also uh, increase the pool of good quality opportunities that we could, you know, partner with and hopefully bring to the patients. Okay, so I think we're about at time. Uh, obviously, lots of uh, headwinds, 
but uh, unmet need not going away and novel technology continuing to be translated, uh, excitement around regulatory concessions, validation of, of biomarkers, uh, selection of uh, different disease, uh, different indications to pursue, uh, all of which I think spells uh, positively or uh, reads positively for this sector. I, I feel more optimistic this year than I have uh, in year, in, in, at least compared to last year. Um, and so I think things are continuing to look up. And so I want to thank our panel. I want to thank my co-moderator, Jay Olson. Uh, this has been a no, no downtime, which is great. I think everyone contributed well, and um, I really appreciate it, and I appreciate the audience's time. Wish you all a, a productive week. Uh, if you're staying for the week at J.P. Morgan, and, and, and thanks, and thanks to the organizers. Thank you. Thank you.